everyone. Um, I am uh, really excited to introduce John Shu, uh, who's coming to, um, from UC San Diego up to us today. John uh, did his undergrad in med school at Northwestern. He went to Mass General for internship and residency. Uh, did his fellowship in uh, cardiology and EP uh, at UCSF, got a master's in clinical research at the time. And he's been at UC San Diego uh, since then. He's now an associate professor. Um, I met John, actually this is the first time even vis I think visually I'm meeting you. Um, uh, but probably about five, six years ago, I approached him about doing a research study, which we put into a couple studies um, from the NCDR ICD registry, because he had been on the committee and I'd been impressed um, with his comments at the time. Um, so we ended up uh, doing a couple of publications that obviously when you do the uh, ICD registry, it is observational data um, and it takes a while to get that data out there. Um, and I also um, think probably he asked me to do it around that time that I wrote one of his letters to um, as an outside reviewer to be his uh, uh, for promotion for him. Um, John has been great. He's had a very productive career. He's uh, has uh, pushing almost about 100 publications or so um, during his time. Uh, and uh, his CV is quite uh, lengthy. Um, it is um, quite impressive. So uh, he's coming here today. He's going to be interviewing with a lot of people today in terms uh, or uh, for the EP section chief uh, position. And I'm really excited to hear him talk about leveraging observational data to research clinical outcomes in cardiac arrhythmia care. So thanks, John. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Very kind of you. Uh, and hi, everyone here at University of Washington. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to nice to be here with you all. And I'll just go on and get into it, if you will. Uh, here are my disclosures. And then I have another disclosure size slide, which is that everybody thinks on the West Coast that I was from the West Coast originally. But um, my true disclosure is that I'm actually from this state in the United States. I'm from Wisconsin, born and raised. Um, some other disclosures are that we're known for being from Wisconsin for beer um, and cheese. Those are some things. But the reason why our family or my family uh, was in Wisconsin was because of this thing, which is called ginseng. Uh, it's a it's an herbal uh, root that uh, I grew up on a farm. If you if you well, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I worked on a farm growing up, um, and we would farm ginseng, and uh, that was the family business growing up. But then I've slowly migrated to the West Coast, which involves Chicago, as uh, Jordan talked about, then Boston, San Francisco, and then San Diego. And now I'm here and um, giving you this talk in Seattle. So wonderful to be here. You guys know the weather patterns on the way here. There's Chicago on, uh, on Lakeshore Drive. Boston was, was tough. This was actually me in San Francisco, who, and I know one of your uh, esteemed faculty here, Jamie McCabe, you can see, um, what is it, fourth from the left, second from the right there, as we did fellowship together at UCSF. And he's had an illustrious career here at University of Washington in the weather here um, in, there, there in San Diego. This was my path if you're a baseball fan. So if you're a baseball fan, uh, you know, the, the season is going to start is what we hear. When I was uh, in Chicago, the Cubs finally won a World Series. And then Boston won the World Series when I was there for residency. And the Giants won two World Series while I was there. So maybe the Padres will win. And then, uh, and then uh, I don't know how the Mariners are doing recently, but uh, this is kind of a nice view of San Diego and baseball if you ever get a chance to, to go there. Um, enough about my disclosures. My talk today hopefully will be germane to a population of cardiologists and EPs that are interested in uh, this type of work, but I'd like to give a general summary about epidemiology and outcomes research in general, and with a specific focus on research in cardiac electrophysiology and arrhythmia procedures and cardio cardiology care. We're going to take a kind of a whirlwind tour of what we do in the EP lab as far as procedural uh, um, uh, procedures that we perform for our patients uh, across arrhythmia uh, uh, subsets. And, and see some of the, the ways that we can uh, look at outcomes in these patient populations. So the general aspect of epidemiology and outcomes research is that 
uh, you know, this is clinical investigations to uh, investigate outcomes of health practices. And the goal that what we're trying to do is study the end result of health services. And we're trying to take the entire picture in mind, right? Patient experiences, their preference, their values. And we want to uh, provide scientific evidence uh, related to decisions made by all individuals who participate in healthcare. And we're trying to apply clinical and population-based research to really optimize the end results of healthcare benefit patient and society, identify shortfalls in practice, adverse events, and develop strategies to improve care. You know, these type of um, goals or desires are, are pervasive in, in medicine and cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, obviously, as a cardiac electrophysiologist, we are detail-oriented individuals that pour over electrograms and are in the EP lab a lot, but we really seek to, to do this overarching uh, goal of improving the overall health of our pa patients, even though that may seem like a, 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 a very uh, uh, high goal. So when we talk about outcomes research, we, we need to compare it to what probably is considered the gold standard, right? Which is clinical trials or randomized controlled trials. Um, the similarities is that th those type of studies seek to provide evidence of which interventions work, which type of patients they work best in, and under which specific circumstances. Um, but there are differences in the methodology of these uh, type of ways to analyze data or analyze or approach a clinical question. Um, in experimental design is uh, more germane to clinical trials, whereas non-experimental designs are in, uh, seen in observational science. And the intervention being evaluated is oftentimes not limited to medications or new clinical procedures, and it may focus on uh, particular services or resources and uh, focus on spe specific policies. And a lot of these uh, findings by observational uh, data may be used by legislative bodies, financial bodies. We've seen the FDA interested in some of the work that we've done um, and some additional interests in the differences between observational uh, data analysis versus clinical trials registry analysis is that uh, there are, are other parameters that need to be considered. Certainly cost when it comes to clinical trials versus uh, observational studies uh, is higher in, in clinical trials, as well as uh, in specific circumstances, patient preference uh, may be, it may be easier to do observational data. And one of the things that I think uh, we've seen in, in our reviews and, and how we think about these clinical questions is that a lot of the uh, outcomes that we investigate are more real world. Uh, they apply to the patient population that one is seeing in clinic, as opposed to a randomized clinical trial, which may or may not enroll the specific patient populations or real world uh, sicker population that we see in clinical practice. And the results of these type of data are really, I think, important. They're used by legislative bodies, financial bodies, government, insurers, payers, um, so these type of data are important, I think, for to facilitate decision making and what intervention is best for patients and payers determine what they are willing to pay for based on some of this type of research. So in cardiovascular medicine and in cardiovascular electrophysiology, AFib is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. We're trying to get at all these aspects of risk factors, treatments, outcomes. Um, and when we talk about how do we get to answer these questions, certainly there will be clinical trials, but a lot of the, 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 the interesting questions that we want to uh, ask about need funding and they need registry type data in large patient populations in order to determine what type of uh, outcomes are occurring in our patients. So one of these, uh, one of these aspects happened years back with the fiscal cliff when there was legislation actually to, as an incentive to improve funding through Medicare and other ways of funding registries and, and clinical trial do, uh, registry dollars to advance really clinical data registries and improve the quality of healthcare. And I think we've seen this in other uh, aspects of cardiology care and, and with the data that we've seen through large registry and, and large uh, cardiology bodies. So uh, 
not all studies can be performed with a randomized control trial, right? And there's much to be learned in cardiology, whether it be atrial fibrillation, cardiovascular disease, or heart failure with epidemiologic studies and database clinical registries. And I, I think some of the largest bodies that we work with uh, include the American Cardio Cardiology, uh, American Car College of Cardiology, uh, the American Heart Association. And when we talk about these large databases or large registries that uh, try to benchmark, improve clinical care, and do research uh, in order to find out which patients uh, are doing better or worse. Uh, the I, We really look to these large bodies in order to help us with the science. And that's the NCDR, the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, and with American Heart Association, uh, get with the guidelines. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of these large um, bodies and, and, and some of the work that we've we've done with specific ones. Uh, and then uh, talk about some of the, the, the data that I'd like to share with you in regards to uh, clinical questions that we wondered and uh, were able to answer, I think, through some of the some of the observational science that, that we've been performing. <clears throat> the <clears throat> the ACC NCDRs, uh, American College of Cardiology data suite of data registries. It's one of the most comprehensive outcomes-based quality improvement programs in the United States. Over 2,400 hospitals and uh, over 1,000 outpatient providing providers uh, involved in this. And the suite uh, really covers across cardiology care, anything from acute coronary syndrome, cath and PCI, uh, adult congenital, uh, TAVR, and then in the EP sphere, uh, EP devices, including ICD, uh, outpatient clinical care across the cardiovascular spectrum with Pinnacle and uh, specific EP procedures that we perform, left atrial appendage occlusion and AFib ablation, actually. So this is our kind of <clears throat> the EP area that we've been looking at. With AHA, uh, get with the guidelines. This is a quality improvement campaign for cardiovascular uh, care. Uh, they try to improve patient outcomes in key areas of cardiovascular disease with hospital certification and benchmarking being a big part of what they are trying to perform for hospital level um, information and data. And they look at four major areas, including stroke, heart failure, resuscitation, and atrial fibrillation itself. So both of these groups have ways to answer clinical questions. And I find that for any fellows that are uh, on, on the talk, really a, a really interesting way, if you have a clinical question that comes, on, comes up in the care of your patient, uh, and it has to do with the outcomes uh, that requires admittedly a large amount of power in order to answer that question, these type of data registries are really where uh, clinical questions that require the power to detect a difference are important and, and, and timely and can be used to answer these questions. And they all have a mechanism in order to take proposals in a grant type uh, manner in order to answer these uh, clinical questions. So uh, please feel free if the fellows are interested to, to contact me in order to do this. Uh, but there are other very large registries and da databases that also can help us determine the outcomes of our patients. The CMS and Medicare data linked uh, with other registries, I think, has been instrumental in regards to finding out how our patients do once they are implanted with the device or that they have an EP procedure, because the longitudinal aspect of following these patients and determining if they're hospitalized or have uh, adverse events is very important. And admittedly, part of what I was talking about with uh, the United States government investing in outcomes for all care, all healthcare, including cardiovascular care, is uh, some of the work that the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has done, uh, including the healthcare utilization and cost and utilization project. You know, these are one of the largest collection of longitudinal hospital care data in the United States. Uh, a lot of this data are posted and free for uh, individuals to analyze. Uh, and it brings data from state data organization, hospital association, private payers, and the federal government in order to collate this data so that it can be analyzed uh, in order to look at the outcomes of our patients uh, in, with and without procedures. So another plug for why clinical registries, uh, you know, they provide the power. Sometimes fellows have a really interesting question, uh, but 
it's just too hard to answer that in a single center study or even a multi-center study, or it, it doesn't make sense to do so in a, a randomized controlled trial. Often the larger number of, number of patients that are involved in these registries <clears throat> allow better estimation, estimation of event rates. Certainly costs may be uh, important as they, these type of studies are less expensive than randomized controlled trials. And what we find is that the real world generalizability of what we're researching actually pertains to our patients because these are patients that we're taking care of already uh, that are captured within these registries. And then oftentimes, if you're able to particularly link with other um, entities, long-term follow-up can be obtained to determine how your patient does in the long-term. What, why not clinical registries? What are some of the, the aspects that, that may be difficult and, or, or challenging? Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to identify and, uh, and uh, control for all sorts of bias. And, and the analysis can be challenging. This, these type of analyses statistically um, are, are challenging because there may be variability in time for interval visits uh, and change in practice over time and vari variability in treatment. So statistically, this can also be very challenging. So, uh, you know, the next part of my talk, I'd like to talk about several areas and uh, examples of where we think and we hope that registry and outcomes have helped with clinical questions and dilemma as a, uh, to really show how these type of data can help uh, a general cardiologist and a cardiac electrophysiologist, interventional cardiologist, treat their patients, answer clinical questions, uh, and some of the some of the work that that we've done in this realm. Now, you know, an, an area where I would say in cardiology that has really been transformative, that's not in my particular area of expertise, has, has been really the movement towards transradial approach for um, interventional cardiac care. And, you know, over my career, I've seen this transition from transfemoral to transradial PCI and, and interventions and as far as diagnostic catheterization as well. And this type of, obviously there have been randomized controlled trials in this realm to show this, but really some of the more impressive data I would say has come from registry type data to really show that this change in practice has been transformative in regards to improving outcomes in regards to uh, improvement in the care of these patients and their rates of adverse events. So this study was done in the NCDR looking at radial access for PCI and STEMI. They studied 294,000 patients undergoing PCI for STEMI at over 1,000 1, hospitals. You know, just the sheer number of patients that are studied really goes to show you the power of a study to detect a difference uh, in what they looked at. They use a propensity score analysis um, to look at uh, transfemoral versus transradial. And what they found is that the transradial approach really decreased mortality, and procedure success was better, and bleeding was less. So in this large cohort of real-world patients that were compared of transradial versus transfemoral, really goes to show that outcomes can be improved just by um, dividing a specific cohort and looking at it um, by the means one is getting access to. So I show this as an example where, uh, you know, if you, if you cast 10 people and you think that transradial is better because you did it in five people versus transfemoral, it's hard to show that difference. But when you have 300,000 patients, really, I think this type of effect can be shown and, and really improved. And that's why we've seen the uh, increase in, in transradial uh, throughout even more contemporary practice, I think. Now, when it comes to the specialty that's more near and dear to my heart, which is electrophysiology, what, what I'd like to say is that, uh, you know, when, when Jordan and I and others and Jeannie and are poring over uh, electri electrograms or implanting a device in the EP lab, um, you know, that's pretty detailed uh, procedural or non-procedural work. Uh, but a lot of what we wonder and how our patients do or ways to improve the care of our patients don't have to do with a specific move or uh, maneuver in the EP lab. It just have to do with clinical questions that we have about which patients do better and which patients do worse. So I'd like to highlight some areas um, that 
that pertain to electrophysiology that ho hopefully are also important to a uh, general cardiologist and ways that we've been able to leverage uh, clinical trials and outcomes research and, and really maybe ma make a make a plug, but also uh, show that, you know, developing this type of expertise or a center um, at an institution that really looks at these type of data, uh, whether it be clinical trial data, um, Medicare uh, national inpatient sample, uh, really developing arrhythmia outcome center would, I think, really be important in, in transforming care across both regionally and a national and international level for EP and outcomes research. <laughs> Um, so what do we know about these areas? I'm going to talk a little bit about ICD, CRT, atrial fibrillation. You can't avoid it in left atrial uh, pedit fusion. So um, this book is really cheap, 25 cents to determine uh, how to avoid sudden death. Um, here is a way to avoid sudden death, which is to have a defibrillator, but there's a bullet in it. But that's how that saved lives. Um, there's been controversy in our field, however, and I think general cardiologists may be aware of this um, paper that came out in JAMA in 2011 that showed that, uh, unfortunately, there appeared to be some evidence that there was non-evidence-based implantation of defibrillators in the United States. When they looked at uh, the NCDR ICD registry and looked at uh, a retrospective cohort study in the study of over 111,000 patients, uh, patients, 25,000 of them, so 22% uh, had what was categorized as non-evidence-based implantation of a defibrillator. And those who received a non-evidence-based ICD had a significantly higher risk of adverse events. Um, and it this appeared to be an effect where electrophysiologists tended to implant less of these non-evidence-based ICD implantations, so they were more evidence-based, if you will. Um, but I don't think that that was really what we garnered from this study. What we garnered from the study is that in specific cases where the data are clear and there are class recommendations, including implanting a defibrillator if in mild cardiac function less than 40 days, or if you haven't had long enough heart failure, or you have you're too sick with NYHA class four symptoms that aren't ambulatory, you know these are the patients where we may need to be cautious that data are pretty clear and our guidelines guide us that implanting an ICD in everyone is not the the best effect. And we can we can uh, we don't want to harm patients is is uh, is what we want to establish. So today is Friday, so thank goodness it's Friday. We actually, um, it's almost a weekend, and we actually had a question when it come, came to how patients are doing. Is, uh, you know, at the institution that we were at, we would implant defibrillators on nights and weekends. And there's been a lot of, uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, data in regards to interventions performed. Now, interventions obviously on nights and weekends are a little bit different, but we wanted to, to ask the question, if, if an implantable cardioverter defibrillator is considered elective, um, but can be implanted on nights and weekends, is it possible that patients could do worse it, it, when, this, when this actually occurs? And uh, we published this in the American Heart Journal looking at this exact question in the NCDR with the, with the idea that since hospitals are only in general, uh, able to provide available services on most weekdays and during business hours, that perhaps complications from this type of procedure could be higher on nights and weekends. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why um, nights and weekends could be more challenging for individuals. So what we did was um, divided these type of implantations into specific cohorts uh, of when they were performed, including the afternoon and evening and weekends and holidays. Uh, with the idea that these type of factors, including operator fatigue, handoffs, reduced staffing, could affect the uh, outcomes of our patients that are being performed. Now, I would say that this type of analysis can only be performed in a large cohort of patients because that magnitude of effect uh, or association is going to be quite small if it is present, and the ability to detect that um, association is, is requires a large amount of uh, patients. And this 
NC, we decided to use the NCDR ICD registry between uh, 2010 and 2012 for over 148,000 patients. We adjusted for potential confounding variables uh, and divided the procedure time of day to morning, afternoon, and evening, and the day of the week to the midweek, Tuesday and Thursday, and then Tuesday through Thursday, and then weekends, and look at Monday and Friday actually uh, separately. And then we looked at all outcomes, including complications, length of stay, and mortality. So thankfully for the electrophysiologists out there, most of the ICD implants were performed in the morning during and during the regular work week. So 97.5% were performed during the regular work week, but there were ICD implants after hours and on the weekends. And specific to the time of day, what was found was that uh, when you perform the ICD implant in the evening, your length of stay went up uh, as did uh, as did if you implanted in the afternoon. Um, and then in regards to the day of the week, what was found was that really weekends and holidays, if implanted on weekends and holidays, did have a prolonged uh, hospital stay and an increased risk of in hospital death. So there was an association of weekend holiday implantation and adverse event. So, you know, what we learned from this is that maybe we should consider scheduling these procedures uh, as early as possible and avoiding the weekends for an elective procedure. And I think these type of analyses and, and data have uh, underpinnings in, in the later day effect and how to treat our patients or hopefully uh, avoid specific hospital policy in order to treat um, our patients better. So for those uh, out there that don't implant ICDs, one of the things that we do is, is may do during the procedure is actually test the device. So um, it may seem to a general cardiologist that uh, it's, it's weird not to test the device. And when we say test, uh, our definition may be different than, than uh, what one imagines with testing. But when we implant an ICD, we can induce ventricular fibrillation test that the device can sense the arrhythmia and, and actually uh, shock the patient out of the arrhythmia. And that is uh, usually called defibrillation testing, uh, whether you test the threshold or not, um, or how much energy one needs to, to defibrillate somebody. Uh, the common practice in, in, contemporary, um, in contemporary practice has actually gone away from potentially testing the device with high energy devices, many uh, in individuals are, are actually not testing, they're implanting the device and not testing. And there have been some uh, randomized clinical trial uh, looking at whether to test or not to test. And, and I would say that there is clinical equipoise in this question. And I think a lot of us practice differently in regards to specifically whether to test or test. But in when we implant these devices, certainly testing is the most common thing. And what we sought in this analysis was really to look at predictors of when you do test, who is going to have a problem in coming, up, becoming, coming out of that arrhythmia, or who is unlikely to be able to be rescued or shocked out of, uh, out of, out of their arrhythmia. That's called an inadequate defibrillation safety margin. And we looked at this in this registry anal analysis looking for predictors of who may not have an adequate defibrillation safety margin when you test them for ICDs. We published this in, in JAK uh, in 2014, um, knowing that defibrillation testing it, at that point was often performed in ICD implantation and with higher output devices and better in device and lead technology that there was this tendency perhaps not to test. And therefore maybe a tool that one could utilize by a simple counting up simple comorbidities could be used as a discriminative function in determining who would have or would not have an adequate or inadequate defibrillation safety margin so that one could use this, uh, these uh, risk factors in order to determine maybe who's at most risk for not having an adequate defibrillation safety margin. We looked at this in the ICE registry um, with standard analyses that, that we've done previously or I've shown previously, looking for identify those factors that were most predictive of an inadequate defibrillation safety margin, which we defined uh, 
um, as the lowest successful energy tested less than two, 10 joules from the maximum output of the device, meaning that you're able to rescue the patient with uh, a, a threshold of energy or a large enough energy that you're confident that this will work in the real world. And we looked at adverse events associated with this as well. When we studied this in this large cohort, what we found was that when we, in those tested, 12,000 uh, patients had an inadequate defibrillation safety margin. So about 10% did not have an adequate safety margin for uh, being comfortable with that patient in the real world. So we were able to devise a, a relatively simple risk score to identify eight uh, variables that were uh, able to characterize patients at higher and lower risk of an inadequate defibrillation safety margin. And those variables included uh, younger age, uh, race was involved, their New York Heart Association class, uh, the lack of ischemic heart disease, renal dialysis, uh, and their indication for ICD type and the type of device that they had. And when you count up, here was the frequency of the, these risk scores, and how often they occurred across the spectrum of the, um, of the cohort. Uh, most of the patients uh, did not have a high risk score, uh, but some of them did have uh, a high risk score. Uh, what we found was that an inadequate defibrillation safety margin was, was associated with a higher risk of complications, a longer hospital stay, and in-hospital mortality. And the implication is that this simple risk score may be able to help identify those with uh, that you implant an ICD in whom you may want to consider uh, testing uh, due to the fact that a, a higher score was associated with an inadequate defibrillation safety margin. And then whether these association with complications and adverse events are a marker or a true result of defibrillation testing, uh, I think is a little bit more challenging to, to ascertain from these type of uh, analyses. So uh, this type of I, data, I think, really um, look, made us look at specific populations with, the same, with a similar question. Uh, does this pertain to a specific population? And Jordan Bruken uh, really did this nicely, I think, in specific population. Uh, so he, we published this in uh, the International Journal of Cardiology in 2020 looking at defibrillation threshold testing or defibrillation safety margin in a, in a specific population, a pediatric population. This is probably one of the largest studies in a pediatric population with defibrillation testing uh, that was published in the past couple of years. Um, and what we found was that defibrillation testing is still performed quite frequently actually in a pediatric population, so 64%, but this decreased over time uh, as it is in the adult population. And that the inadequate defibrillation safety margin that I highlighted is occurring even more frequently in a pediatric population at 13%. Uh, thankfully, DFT testing itself was not associated with in-hospital complications or deaths, but was associated with a longer hospital stay. Interestingly, if the pediatric patient did have an inadequate defibrillation safety margin, it was associated with an increased risk of complication. So the question was whether this was truly a marker for complications and from, uh, from the device or just a marker of a, a substrate of the patient that, that is having a difficulty time defibrillating. And we also extended this, Jordan uh, extended this to the congenital heart disease patients. They're, these patients are becoming much more frequent, of course, in our clinical care and their EP, um, care and ICD implantation, explantation, and device management has been more complex. So again, this is one of the largest study I think uh, ever published in the congenital heart disease realm, also looking at ICDs where an inadequate, uh, this was published in Jack Cardiac uh, Clinical Electrophysiology by Jordan, uh, looking at this the defibrillation safety margin testing in a congenital heart disease patient population. And DFT testing was not associated with in-hospital complications or death, thankfully, but was associated with a prolonged hospital stay. And if you had an inadequate defibrillation safety margin, this was not associated with hospital death or complication, suggesting that perhaps testing these individuals may be reasonable and continue to be uh, performed.
other devices that we use, including cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, really, I think, require large cohorts and large data analysis and long-term follow-up to assess response and whether or not these type of therapies are improving the care of our patients and specifically which populations we need to study in order to improve the care of our patients. Um, so when we think about cardiac resynchronization therapy, the, the LD lead, that, that extra lead that helps synchronize by biventricular pacing to improve the ejection fraction of our heart failure uh, population, the older data would suggest that 30% uh, of patients get worse or don't get better with cardiac resynchronization. So we really need to, I would say, improve. That's a large amount of people that don't respond. So maybe part of that is really identifying those individuals that really truly respond to this therapy so that we can be more specific in our criteria, our guidelines of who we implant with these devices and who we do not in order to not put them at risk as well. When we looked at this in a, in a, in a large uh, sub-analysis of the MADE-IT CRT study, we knew that there were this, was this wide variability in who responded to CRT. Uh, what we wanted to see is maybe by looking at super responders, those that really dramatically improve their left ventricular ejection fraction, we can identify those individuals who really do respond and therefore focus on those individuals. We looked at this randomized controlled trial sub-analysis with paired electrogram, uh, echocardiograms at baseline and at one year follow-up to determine who really responded to CRT in this randomized controlled trial, and then analyzed uh, what real true predictors predicted this uh, amazing response to CRT. In this cohort, we had over 191, we had 191 super responders who increased their ejection fraction by about 15%. And uh, to just breeze through these, in multivariable analysis, we found six predictors that were associated with an improved left ventricular ejection fraction super response to CRT uh, therapy. And these are really the variables that have been that were defined in this study, but also uh, many of them have also been defined in other studies. So female sex, uh, a prolonged QRS duration greater than 150 milliseconds, left bundle branch block at baseline, a lower body mass index was associated with a higher chance of response, no prior myocardial infarction, so essentially uh, non ischemic like cardiomyopathy, and actually um, a lower left atrial volume index was associated with a higher uh, chance of response. And when you looked at responders and how they did, if they were categorized as super responders or just responders, as opposed to people that didn't respond, what we found was that the super responders, as expected, had a dramatic improvement in uh, or dramatically uh, did much better in regards to heart failure, death, and ventricular arrhythmia events. In fact, when you through all variables in the model in this cohort of patients and determine what are the most uh, important variables as far as how this cohort does. It really is, do they respond to CRT? And then whether uh, they have um, renal dysfunction, if their creatinine was, was high, they did poorly. Uh, left bundle branch block actually was protective, likely mediated through uh, being able to respond to CRT itself. So what we learned from the study was that uh, in regards to CRT response, there are really specific clinical predictors, patient factors that can help us identify who we need to focus on. And that super response really was associated with much improvement in patient care. And when you look at this across the cohort of EP studies that have looked at response to CRT, many of these variables are, are, um, are, go across the spectrum of other studies. And this definition of response is one, a, a question that I think will be, be going on for a while as far, as far as how we actually define response. And many of us define it by the left ventricular end systolic volume and left ventricular end diastolic volume. But I think that these type of data really spawned other types of data in regards to looking at true registry analyses to determine what type of patients, particularly with their bundle branch block morphology, do and do, 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 do and don't do better. And when this was looked at in the 
in long-term outcomes in the NCDR ICD registry. This is a retrospective cohort that linked to Medicare. So linking to Medicare gives longitudinal data on these individuals. And this was a very neat analysis that they did looking at left bundle branch block or non-left bundle branch block uh, patients and then divided into cure restoration of 150 or less than 150. And they looked at outcomes, including all that one would expect in a cardiovascular longitudinal study, mortality, heart failure, readmissions. So the large scale study, 24,000 CRT implants uh, followed for one and three years. So pretty long-term outcomes as, uh, as well. And what they found was that the three-year mortality and one-year all-cause readmission were really truly lowest among the left bundle branch block patients and the cure restoration greater than 150 milliseconds. And this really, I think, informed and supported the guidelines uh, that are in place really to implant these devices in left bundle branch block and cure restoration. If you see a heart failure patients with either or both of these characteristics, that these are really the patients that are going to respond to CRT. And that's really what they found in this study was that cure restoration and left bundle branch block status were really the biggest drivers to uh, avoid uh, that patients did do better when implanted with these characteristics. I'm going to switch now uh, to uh, arrhythmia that you guys are, you all will um, take care of a lot, uh, are already taking a, a lot uh, of care of, and we all know why that is. It's just epidemiologically, it's the most common cardiac arrhythmia is not going away and will continue to treat for um, uh, perhaps ever, which is atrial fibrillation. So <clears throat> I'd like to show you some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and improving outcomes in our patients with atrial fibrillation and, and some of the uh, data with newer devices that we've been looking at as well. So uh, when it comes to outcomes in the care of patients with atrial fibrillation, can we identify novel risk factors that, that really predict AFib? And can we look at specific groups to improve their care? I think that this is where a lot of the observational science in EP is going. Uh, electrophysiologists tend to think in electrograms, though, and uh, when this is some data from ways that we try to identify where AFib comes from or how AFib evolves and whether it comes from rotors, whether it comes from the pulmonary veins. Uh, these are the targets that we have when we do procedural-based therapy, including uh, pulmonary vein isolation. This was an interesting study um, in a, in a disease process or an idea in regards to atrial fibrillation that we've always kind of knew, which was that if, if the pulmonary veins are implicated in causing atrial fibrillation, and that's where our ablation therapy is guided, then when somebody has atrial ectopy or PAC, isn't that, shouldn't that be a predictor of atrial fibrillation? We often target this in, in, in the, these procedures. And this unique study looked at a, a large prospective cohort study um, and looked at PACs to, to determine whether or not they were actually truly associated with uh, atrial fibrillation. So this was performed in, in, in a database from the cardiovascular health study, looked at PACs in Holter monitor and found that PACs were associated with incident AFib. In fact, doubling of the hourly PAC rate was associated with a significant increase in atrial fibrillation risk. Um, so it, it, this study, in my mind, kind of cinched the aspect that PACs, just like we think about in the EP lab, uh, truly are associated with the risk of, of incident uh, atrial fibrillation in the future. Uh, some other things that spawned our interest in risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation um, was just being in San Francisco when, when uh, treating a lot of patients with uh, HIV. And at that time, not much had been uh, looked at in regards to arrhythmia outcomes in this patient population, whether this was a risk factor for developing atrial fibrillation. And this is what caused us to look at that in a large population of, uh, again, a large database of population for this clinical question that we had, which was, can HIV and markers of HIV disease uh, severity 
put people at risk for developing atrial fibrillation. We know that this is still a major public health problem <clears throat> and that in other disease process within cardiology, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, congestive heart failure, HIV patients have been shown to be associated or um, uh, have higher risks of these disease processes in cardiovascular care. So shouldn't the same mechanism be involved in atrial fibrillation? What we did was uh, wanted to examine the incidence of AFib in a large population of HIV infected patients to look at their CD4 counts and high viral loads. And we chose the VA uh, HIV clinical case registry because it was a large uh, registry with clinical care for these patients that had laboratory and other type of data. And what we found with 30,000 patients identified in the VA with HIV, we included a, a, about that many in an analysis and followed them for you know, 6.8 years in this uh, retrospective analysis. We looked for the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation as an inpatient or outpatient and really looked at serologic markers of HIV disease ser severity. So their CD4 count, their viral load, we adjusted for um, any potential confounders. And what we found was that 2.6% uh, of patients had a new AF diagnosis who had HIV. This is a younger population of patients. Their average age is 46 to 53 uh, uh, years of age. And the overall incidence of AF was 3.6 events per thousand person years. Um, look at the incidence rates of atrial fibrillation in, in comparison to other uh, cohort studies of, of young men. Uh, you can see there that the, the, our clinical case registry of HIV studies had higher risk of atrial fibrillation incidence risk compared to Framingham, compared to other um, la large cohorts of uh, healthy men. Um, and what we found was that in general is really to drive home the scientific aspect of maybe that the HIV or HIV disease severity is associated with the risk of atrial fibrillation. Really these serologic markers of a lower CD4 count was associated with a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation and a higher viral load was associated with a higher atrial fibrillation. I really think speaks to the how this study identified uh, a link between the association of HIV and atrial fibrillation. Uh, we all know that in a AFib, the feared sequelae stroke and uh, you know identifying those patients or how we're doing at treating this population are uh, in regards to stroke risk reduction is really important. Uh, AFib, again, is gonna keep continuing to be a problem because as our older population in the United States gets older, it's gonna overlap with where we are dealing uh, with these patients because age is one of the biggest risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So we know that this, this issue comes up, I think, in our clinical care. We know that whether one is proxismal versus persistent, that their stroke risk doesn't really determine, isn't, shouldn't be determined based on paroxysmal or persistent. At least that has to do with our ways to treat stroke risk in atrial fibrillation. Um, yet, I think part of the, the issue is that despite studies like this, this is an active W sub, sub study looking at whether you divide patients into proxysmal or persistent AFib, that their stroke risk is about the same and that therefore guideline-based practice states that one shouldn't take this into consideration when determining to use anticoagulation, right? It, it shouldn't have to do with paroxysmal or persistent AFib. It should have to do with their CHADS VAS score. I think one of the things that we noticed was that clinical care and biases that perhaps the, the, the cardiologist has is changing the care of patients based on this subtype. Uh, whether or not it's because they're paroxysmal and in, in front of your eyes, their sinus rhythm on that day in clinic versus persistent on EKG in your clinic, and you can't really avoid the fact that they're in AFib. We had this idea that despite these guidelines that there are really truly differences in anticoagulation therapy practice in patients who have different subtypes of AFib. We looked at this in the Pinnacle Registry and published this in the American Journal of Medicine with the idea that if you're proximal versus persistent, guidelines call that for oral anticoagulation using the CHADS-2 or CHADS-VAS score now, um, but that differences may exist in the appropriate care for these patients 
And those that have paroxysmal AFib may not be treated with oral anticoagulation as readily. So we identified individuals with the CHADS-2 score because it's an older cohort greater than two in the NCDR pinnacle registry, a large registry of cardiovascular care under the ACC um, and determined whether or not their antithrombotic treatment differed between patients with paroxysmal versus persistent. What we found was that most patients were paroxysmal in this cohort, about 78%, and that when you adjusted for all uh, comorbidities, uh, patients with paroxysmal AFib, uh, patients with persistent AFib were more, were less likely, sorry, were more likely to receive oral anticoagulation. So if they were paroxysmal, they were less likely to receive oral anticoagulation, despite having a guideline-based indication to prescribe oral anticoagulation. And what was found was that paroxysmal patients, despite having a guideline-based indication for oral anticoagulation, were prescribed oral anticoagulation therapy less and were prescribed actually no therapy or antiplatelet therapy, which we know does not help with AFib stroke um, more often. So just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. And that's, I think, certainly exists with paroxysmal AFib and their risk of stroke. Um, and then we performed this analysis really trying to highlight how I think we're not doing well uh, across the spectrum of stroke risk in anticoagulating our patients. And I think this is germane to um, general cardiologists and electrophysiologists. Really, and we published this in JAMA Cardiology in 2016, looking at atrial fibrillation across the spectrum of stroke risk in the in real world when we're defining these stroke risk parameters by the CHADS-2 and now the CHADS-VAS score. When we look at the ACC NCDR pinnacle registry, and determine all AFib patients, define their chads vas score, and say, hey, are we anticoagulating them? We identified 400,000 patients treated by cardiovascular specialists. The pinnacle registry are cardiovascular specialists, so we're supposed to know what we're doing. And when we look at AFib treatment across the spectrum of chads vas score, um, overall, oral anticoagulation prevalence did not top 50%, even the highest risk population. So here's the CHADS VAS scores. And in the highest CHADS VAS score patients, uh, only 50 to 60% of patients received oral anticoagulation, suggesting that we have a lot of work to do in order to treat our patients and prevent strokes in them, even particularly in the higher stroke risk categories. Now, how do we do that? Um, I would argue left atrial appendage occlusion uh, is a way to help uh, our patients who may not be able to take oral anticoagulation. And I, I'm not going to go too much into the procedure itself. I, I would say that this has evolved quite a bit since 2015 when left atrial appendage occlusion um, was FDA approved with the Watchman device. But I do want to talk about some of, I think, the observational data that has come about now to help identify the safety and efficacy of this procedure, as well as really subpopulations that we've looked at uh, to determine who is at higher risk of, of, of adverse events. So uh, this portion of the talk, I'd like to talk about some real world clinical data on LAL outcomes and then specific patient groups. So when we look at left atrial appendage occlusion um, as a procedure, this is probably the, the most contemporary in regards to how we're doing. And the NCDR left atrial appendage occlusion registry has over 38,000 procedures performed by over 1,000 physicians at about 500 hospitals and contemporary practice. Uh, most cases, the device is being deployed and uh, being successful in about 93% of cases. In most cases, the device is being deployed without any leak around the device. Major in-hospital adverse events are occurring in about 2% of patients. And most complications were uh, one that is feared, which is pericardial fusion requiring intervention. That's about 1.4%. So this, these are where observational data, registry data can help us determine how we're doing and where we need to improve from, I would say. And we took part of this data and really um, decided to look at it in a different subset of data, really identify adverse events from left atrial appendage occlusion. Our group looked at uh, the national inpatient sample and published this in Heart Rhythm this past year, really looking at 
the dreaded complication of pericardial effusion requiring intervention from these procedures in over uh, 17,000 patients with LAAO to determine how common this really was in real world practice in the national inpatient sample. What we found was that it did occur in about 1.3% of patients. So I think we need to tell our patients that about 1% of the time, unfortunately, pericardial effusion requiring intervention is necessary in left atrial appendage occlusion. I think we're getting better, but these our contemporary data, and that when you have this complication, unfortunately, it is associated with a higher risk of death, a longer hospital stay, and a higher cost of the actual procedure itself. What predicts pericardial effusion in left atrial appendage occlusion? If you're older and a higher chance vas score, and if you're obese, those are the predictors of pericardial effusion in LAAO. And how about readmission? And re readmission is an important aspect. When we looked at this in left atrial appendage occlusion in the national readmission database, again, this is the AHRQ database that we can analyze basically with, with statistical uh, expertise to look at outcomes and predictors of readmission after LAO. And when we looked at this in a propensity match cohort, I, I really liked this analysis because I thought it was very um, important. But what we found was that all-cause readmission uh, and, uh, for left atrial appendage occlusion appeared to be high. 9.4% were readmitted within three days, um, uh, 30 days, sorry. And most of them were readmitted for GI bleeding. What's interesting is we had a propensity cohort matched cohort. So these were non-left atrial appendage occlusion AF patients. And what we found was that their readmission rate was 10.98%, suggesting that atrial fibrillation is the reason for this, not necessarily left atrial appendage occlusion. And I thought that this was a neat analysis showing that unfortunately this is a sicker population. So LAAO patients compared to just patients that had AF, but not an LAAO, had less in-hospital mortality and less 30-day readmissions, actually. So this just shows that AF is a marker for comorbidities. And when you look at specific outcomes and specific subgroups, I just want to showcase a couple of uh, studies that we did and populations that you may want to be aware of in your patients that you consider sending for left atrial appendage occlusion or not, and then, then I'll uh, finalize. But women versus men is really important, I think, in our patient population. We published this in JAMA Cardiology in 2021, looking at the differences in outcomes of women versus men in LAO of over 49,000 patients. Unfortunately, what we found was that women are at more risk for any adverse event, major adverse event, a prolonged hospital stay and death from LAO, which highlights, I think, our need in, uh, in improving these disparities in cardiovascular care. When women had a problem, it was pericardial effusion requiring drainage. So uh, more, uh, more evidence that we need to improve outcomes in specific populations. And that extends to non-white versus white patients. We looked at racial disparities and published this in Circulation AE from the NIS and white versus non-white patients. What we found in over 34,000 patients is that overall procedural complications were higher in Blacks, Hispanics, and patients of other race compared to white patients. And then uh, when we look at older versus young patients, we have this submitted looking at AF and older patients and LAO and older patients. And what we determined is that older age is not necessarily associated with risk of LAO adverse events, suggesting to me that we can actually consider implanting this in even higher uh, aged patients, elderly patients. It was associated with the risk of mortality, however, so mortality was higher in older in individuals, but other aspects, including major complications, there were no difference once adjusting for other comorbidities. So I'll, I'll skip this part and then summarize my talk so that we have time for questions. But in general, hopefully I showcase that some real world data registries and observational data can help us in regards to the care of our EP uh, patients and the care of cardiovascular patients in general. And as this data becomes more available, hopefully we can improve the care of our patients in total. Uh, thanks for your attention, appreciate everything and happy to answer questions. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, that was great. Uh, I want to uh, get to a question from one of our fellows, Shidanso, and I'm going to piggyback off of it. So uh, he uh, asked uh, your study looking at uh, off-hours implant times of ICDs and the complication rates. Are weekend and holiday ICD implantation data confounded by those patients requiring off-hour ICDs being sicker? So sort of taking off on that, what's your take on just 
a lot of this research in general, having unmeasured confounders when you're talking about outcomes research from some of these large um, databases. Yeah, I think that that's always a criticism, Jordan. Thanks for bringing that up and for your fellow for, for asking it. These are by far the biggest weakness of any studies that nothing, there's no free lunch in life, right? Or research or what have you. Um, and this residual confounding or unmeasured confounders will always be the, 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 the Achilles, well, and a, a major problem with any type of observational studies. I think the, the best thing we can do is find, uh, tailor our question to the, the best registry or clinical data that we can find if one determines that it's an observational question and um, define those variables as best as we can in order to account for that as best we can statistically and clinically. And that's all, that's all we can do, but it will always be an issue with any of this type of, of, of data. So it's um, important, an important point. Uh, and I know it's 8.30, but I want to just give time for Jeannie uh, Poole's question here. Uh, thanks for the great talk. She wants to know about the value of ICDs and non-ischemics, and what are your thoughts on how we should approach this problem to better identify patients most likely to benefit from an ICD? Yeah, what's interesting is, uh, so I think, thanks for your question, Jeannie, and your attention. Uh, I think what Jeannie's talking to is this non-ischemic population is really challenging because we, we know that they are some of the sickest population. They do have a risk for sudden death and ventricular arrhythmias, but there are studies that question with who should actually get a de device, like the Danish study and randomized controlled trials. So I, I think, honestly, Jeannie, like these type of observational data really looking at, and I know we're looking at that in the ICD registry, once we've implanted these individuals compared to the ischemic population, these are these are the questions that I think are ripe for observational data to actually tell us once implanted who actually is having ventricular arrhythmias and who may benefit. And I think that data will come out as these clinical questions become more top of line for what we're wondering. Instead of instead of looking at it prospective, we can look at it retrospective. So that's actually um, some, something that people are studying. Uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna allow one more question. Uh, Jim Kirkpatrick, who's head of our Ecker Lab, asks: Could you comment on the role of hospital level hospital level factors in these analyses? Yeah, so many of the now, um, so that's a very very interesting question. Uh, I I'll try to address it as best as I can. I think what what I'm hearing is that there may be the way to approach this, there may be patient level factors and hospital level factors that uh, affect the outcome. And one of the ways we, it's, it's hard to actually put that in a statistical model, uh, but what many of these analyses do is, is use a hierarchical clustering in order to account for hospital-based uh, confounding variables. So it's a hierarchical analysis statistically to adjust essentially for this type of hospital variation. Um, and we found that, especially for the, the registry analyses, to try to best account for hospital level variables without putting hospital level variables in the actual statistical model. Sorry if that doesn't answer your question. Uh, well, great, thanks so much. We're a little over time here. Uh, thanks, John, for uh, the talk and for coming to visit us here today. Um, and uh, I personally look forward to chatting with you later today. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone, really appreciate it.